that's how I said it. Uh, that gentleman who was playing that, uh, what do you call it, violins and the piano, I wish I could do that. But that's all I'm going to do is wish. And as a result, guess what? Nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to wish I could, and, and next year I'll come and, then, and I'll say, man, I wish I could do that. I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, that kind of ties into what we're going to talk about today. I want to share with you what I think about teaching. And, and you can say at the end, well, I wish I could do that. But if all you do is wish about it, then a year from now we'll be standing right where we're at. So my challenge to you is try and take at least one thing from what I say and say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Don't. It's, uh, it's a bit like conference. We, we, we watch conference. Satan doesn't mind if we watch conference, by the way. How do you know that? Well, I've talked to him. He doesn't mind if we watch conference as long as we don't do anything different as a result. So it's okay to sit here and say, that's awesome, and not do anything different. We call that uh, intellectual cotton candy. It tastes good at the moment, but there's no lasting effect. So my challenge to you is try to take one thing out of what I say today and make it be part of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about teaching, but I'm not just talking about teaching. I'm going to talk about teaching at BYU, and there is a huge difference. And uh, many of you are here. Well, I don't know why many of you are here. But uh, if you're going to be at BYU, what you should do should be different because you're at BYU. If what you're going to do is the same thing you can do anywhere else, please go somewhere else and do that. Because we have a mission here. And it's a very big deal. We are uh, preparing future leaders of the church. Uh, our job here, oh, we're just changing the world, that's it. And I'm not kidding. That's what we're about. And we do it one student at a time. So let me, let me share with you some things. When you drop off your children at kindergarten, what do you hope? Anybody who's done that? Or am I the only one who's ever done that? Please. I just hope they don't cry. I hope they don't cry. What do you hope? I hope they're safe. What else? Please. I hope I don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on if it's your first or your seventh. <laughs> I cried the first one. After that, it was easy. <clears throat> Keep them safe. Find them friends. Help them have fun. Teach them stuff. And that, and that's kind of the order. Keep. Them, I want to be here when I get back this afternoon. Keep them safe, help them find, help them have a blast, and oh, by the way, if you get around to it, teach them stuff. Now, when parents drop their children off at BYU, what do they hope? <laughs> Pretty much the same thing. Keep them safe. Find them friends. And if they can marry one of them, that would be awesome. Uh, help them have fun, teach them stuff, and oh, by the way, please strengthen their testimonies. That is why they sent them here. There are a lot of wonderful schools out there, but the parents hope that this place is different. You can get these top four anywhere, but they bring their children here because they have an expectation that we will strengthen their testimonies. That's our job, to strengthen their testimonies. So, given that, we don't all agree with that. I think we'd all agree, yeah, my, you know, they should have their testimony strengthened. That, by the way, is the religion department. Who's here from religious education? Okay, that's your job. <laughs> Not our job. Oh, I should start with this. I teach accounting. So I naturally have an advantage when it comes to integrating the sacred and the secular. <laughs> because accounting is easy. I recognize that. You've got hard stuff, but I have easy stuff. We're going to leave it to you to strengthen their testimonies while we do what we do best. We all agree they should strengthen their testimonies, and then what do we tend to do? That we teach what we teach so well. I teach accounting, you teach chemistry, you teach biology, you teach psychology. At the start of the semester, we say, then it's going to be different. But when we get down in the trenches, what tends to happen? I go with content. 
Why? Because there's a test they've got to take. There's material that's got to be covered. Why do I go with content? Because I'm good at it. Got a PhD in whatever it is. I'm good at that stuff. I know more than they do. If I start going into the spiritual, trying to integrate the sacred, they know more than I do about that. Now, for those of you who return missionaries, you've got a leg up on the rest of us. I was not one of those. So, you know, I'm not going to go into the sacred and the secular because what do I know? I'm good at content and I know more. I know more about accounting. I know more about accounting. If I took all of you together and added up your accounting, I know more than that. So when it comes to teaching, I'll just go with that. In addition, when time is scarce, which it always is, how many of you ever get to the end of the, the block, you know, the, the time, and say, well, we're, we're five minutes early. Off you go. I don't have anything else to say. It's never that. It's as they're walking out of the door. Oh, by the, it's like that scene in Indiana Jones where they're walking out, and he says, oh, don't forget to read this and that and this and that as they walk out. Nobody ever finishes early. We've got too much to do. Plus, if I'm expected to run a class, content gives me the upper hand. So I understand why we go with content, why we go with our area of expertise, but we've got to remember, they don't send them here for that. That's not why they come here. That's part of why they come here. But we tend to think it's the religion department. It's their job to strengthen testimonies. It's my job to teach accounting. I'm not buying that. That's not why most of you came here anyway. You didn't come here to watch somebody else strengthen these young people's testimonies. That's our job. That's, uh, I, I remember sitting in a, in a conversation with Elder Perry, and I said, Elder Perry, wh what would you like us to do in the business school? And you know, our, Elder Perry being quiet and the way he is, he let me have it with a rather large booming voice. I want future leaders of the church. Okay. That's changed everything I've ever done, because I had an apostle tell me what he wanted. Well, he's not speaking the for the church. Well, he was speaking to me, and that was close enough for me. What I want to do for a minute is share with you lessons I have learned the hard way. Why? So that you may learn to be more wise than I have been. Maybe I can save you some trouble. I... Uh, I got to the top of the teaching ladder and found it was leaning against the wrong wall. And I don't want you to have to do that. So let me share with you some of the things that I have learned. My journey through teaching. Oh, by the way, I'm pretty good at it. Oh, he's bragging. No. Dizzy Dean said, it's not bragging if it's true. But it's like Michael, I remember Michael Jordan said this. Uh, people would say, wow, you have a gift. And he said, well, yeah. I've worked very hard for that gift. I've worked very hard to become a good teacher. And it hasn't been without its issues. But I've worked very hard at it. And let me share with you what I have found. First, step one is you have to have passion. It turns out uh, that passion could be demonstrated in a multitude of ways. Anybody know who John Madden is? He's nuts. He's just out there, excited. He coached football for a time, and he was a uh, commentator for a time. He's just loud and out there, and whoo! It's awesome. That's not me. John Wooden, who was he? He coached UCLA Bruins in basketball forever, and he's awesome. Very quiet, but his players still love him and respect him for his passion for the game. So you've got to figure out what's your, how does your passion come out? Because the truth is, if you're not excited, they're not going to be excited. Hey, we're here to teach Ken. We're here to learn accounting. Won't this be awesome? Well, if I don't have enthusiasm for it, it's not going to spontaneously combust. And they're going to say, wow, I went to a boarding class today, but I love accounting. It doesn't happen. I have to figure out how they can feel my enthusiasm. And it's not the same for everybody. For some people, they're loud and awesome. And for others, they're quiet. But I, I still remember I had Professor Leon Woodfield. 
He was not flamboyant. But man, he was awesome. Incredibly quiet, but I could feel his passion for what he was doing. And that affected me. So we've got to figure out uh, how to show our students our enthusiasm for what we're doing. Now, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I was sure excited about it. That was step one. Step two is I actually learned what I was talking about. That comes. And it's the great fear. Oh, I'm going to stand up in a class and they're going to ask me a question and I don't know. What then? Try this. I don't know. I served at the MTC for a while and missionaries, that was their great fear. They're going to ask me a question I don't know the answer to. True. What's the answer? I don't know, but I'll find out. So, there's this great fear, we won't know what we're talking about. Let me take that fear away. It's real. There are going to be times when you don't know what you're talking about. And guess what? The sun comes up, life is fine, it'll be great. Just learn how to say, I have no idea. Uh, I knew what I was talking about, I could explain it well. It turns out I, I mastered a lot of accounting. And as a result, I got all those high teacher evaluations. You know, the holy grail, I got the teacher evaluations. Woo! And I was in demand, students would line up for my classes. I was, I, I taught, I've taught a lot of places because I'm good at it. And I got awards and recognition and all that sort of thing. And then I realized, that's when I was at the top of the ladder, thinking, man, I got this lit. I'm a scholar, I'm a good teacher, wow, this is it. And then I asked the question, you know, I could do this anywhere. I could have achieved this recognition anywhere. Why was that at BYU? Why was I here? I wish I'd have asked that when I was brand new. I wish I'd have asked, why am I at BYU? If I'm going to be here, my classes need to be different because I am here. This is a unique opportunity to have a different class because you are here at BYU. Turns out I was teaching accounting and the tithe pairs deserve more than that. They deserve more than just spending their money for their children to just learn accounting. They can learn that anywhere. Why was I here at BYU? I decided I've got to do a better job at integrating the sacred and the secular. That's why BYU is. So that while I'm increasing their secular knowledge, that uh, I can strengthen their testimonies, increase their commitment to the kingdom. That's why BYU is. But if I focus on building their testimonies, you know what that means. Less time for content, right? What about my stuff? Well, here's my response to that. Yeah, so? So less time for content. What's the sad truth? Think back to your uh, uh, American Heritage class, if you came here to BYU. How much of that do you remember? Think back to your Biology 101 class. How much of that do you remember? What's the sad truth about what you're teaching? Most of it they're not going to remember. No, except for, except for my class. They'll just drill everything that I have, but too bad for the rest of you. The truth is they're not going to remember much of what I did say anyway. Hopefully I'll change the way they think a little bit. And if it's that important, they'll take another class. Oh, what if they're going to be accounting majors? Well, we'll hit them again with it, and again, and again, and again. But the truth is, if we sacrifice a little content, no permanent damage done. And if we sacrifice it for a greater purpose, it'll actually be worth the trade-off. Now, please don't think for one second that, oh, so yours is a Sunday school class. No, it's not that at all. I teach a class with other people. My students take the same exams that other people's students take. I teach accounting 310, which is the second accounting class. My students have to take the same class, that, or same exams, same quizzes, same everything that everybody else has to take. So I can't sacrifice content to increase their testimonies. My students still have to compete with other students. But remember, the truth is they're going to forget much of what you teach them anyway. 
I hate to be the one to break that to you, but it's true. And if you don't believe it, think about your education. Yeah, but that's different. No, no, it's not. It has to be more than content, folks. It has to be more than content. So I'm going to show you some, content, some comments from my students. These, uh, our student evaluations just came out on Monday. So I copied a couple of stu student comments from my evaluations. And I do this not so that you can say, well, he isn't he something? Or not that I can say, aren't I something? I want you to see that it's possible. And the interesting thing about these comments, and I didn't realize until I pulled these four out, uh, they all apologize for saying this about an accounting class. So here's one. Even though by taking the class, I realized that accounting probably isn't for me. Woo, that was a close call for them, wasn't it? <laughs> I would graduate in accounting just to ha keep having the same amazing spiritual experience that I did in this class. Just Brother Stas provides gospel, prove that the gospel can be taught in any setting or in any place. Even in a county, what's up with that? We can have spiritually uplifting experiences and learn how to represent the Lord in our lives. He promoted the gospel in BYU and accounting in such a powerful way. One of the hardest but best classes I've taken at BYU. I've never felt the spirit so strongly in a class, and he teaches accounting. Now again, I think I have an advantage, but apparently they don't think so. Professor Stice taught me accounting, and I know my education was enriched, but more importantly, he strengthened my testimony and repeatedly exhorted our class to do better spiritually. This class has improved me both, improved both at accounting and as a member of the church. Taught with the spirit, I think this is one of the most spiritual classes I've taken, and I never would have guessed it about accounting 310. Professor Stice did an amazing job in somehow making accounting class a spiritual experience. Folks, if you can do it in accounting, guess what? You can do it anywhere. Because if I were to ask you, you know, if we were to list the majors that don't lend themselves to it, well, the publicans, that's what they call us. The publicans don't lend themselves to this. Well, sometimes they do. Uh, all things are possible if you believe. Uh, it's possible in accounting, it's possible anywhere. So, what to do? Okay, good, it's possible, great. So what can I do about it? <clears throat> Step one is we've got to care for these future leaders of the church. We've got to care about their testimonies, their lives, their brains, and their hearts. We have to care. We've got to not look at them, in my opinion, as students. We're training up future leaders of the church. That changes the whole way I think about it. I'm not teaching accountants. I'm teaching future leaders of the church. <laughs> That just changed my whole frame when, I, when that finally sunk in. Uh, this is bigger than accounting, or bigger than whatever your topic is. This is BYU. It's about more than just that. So how to do it? I've got three things. We always have three things. One is we have to bake the gospel into the class. I was thinking about this. Uh, my mother, we had, uh, there were four, she had four sons. We were about six years apart total. So she was over, she was outmanned and outgunned. She on occasion would make, a cake, would make a cake. And she would set it out to cool. Rarely did it ever get frosted. Because we would just blow through that. Unless she hit it or guarded it. It never made it to be frosted. We just thought, we, in fact, you know, frosting, what's this luxury? It never lasted that long. The frosting wasn't the important part. It was the cake. And when it comes to integrating the sacred and the secular in the Catholic classroom, it's not the frosting. It's not the extra stuff. The gospel is the cake. And we've got to treat it as such. We've got to bake it right into our topics. Uh, again, it's not a Sunday school class. There are times when I walk in and talk to my students about the gospel. But more often than not, I integrate it with what I'm teaching. Well, how do you do that? Well, if you think about it, if you think about your topic, there are lots of ways you can integrate the sacred and the secular. But you have to think about it. It's like wishing I could play the violin. Wishing isn't going to do it. I have to think about it. I have to do something. You can integrate the sacred and the secular, but you have to do it. 
and you have to bake it in. It's not something that uh, will naturally happen in most cases. For the religion professors, awesome, you're lucky. It is the cake. But we have to bake it into our cake. As I teach accounting, one of the ingredients is the gospel. And it's a key ingredient. You ever baked a cake without eggs? I'm such an idiot. I was making a cake once. My wife obviously was not around, and I thought, well, I'm just going to whip up a cake. So I start putting stuff together. You know, I don't do it the way you're supposed to. I don't read the list of ingredients to make sure I've got them. I just jump right in. I get down there, it says eggs. I go to the fridge. I have none. What, what do I do? I just keep going. Let's see what happens. Uh, go home and give that a try. It's not good. <laughs> You have to bake certain things right into it. And when I'm thinking about my class, each and every class session, I think about how am I going to integrate gospel topics into this session? And the more I think about it, the easier it gets. I've been at this for quite a while. It's hard when you start. I'll give you that. But uh, it's easy once you get going. But you have to start trying. If you want to play the violin, you have to pick up a violin. If you want to integrate the sacred and secular, you got to start. Second one I want to talk about is uh, figure out your way to show that you care. Not my, your job is not to be me, and my job is not to be you. You have to figure your way to show these students how you care. And then the third one is look for gospel connections. And I love this, if you see it, say it. If you see a gospel connection, say it. I have found that the more I take that leap of faith, the more awesome it is. So I want to talk about uh, these for just a minute. Baking the gospel into the class. Have you ever heard that Covey story about the big rocks? Some of you have. Most of you, it's too long ago. That book's too old. I just want to quickly share this with you. Uh, one day an expert was speaking to a group of students to drive home a point. Uh, show this spirit. As the man stood in front of the group of high-powered overachievers, he said, okay, time for a quiz. Then he pulled out a one-gallon wide-mouth mason jar and set it on a table in front of him. Then he produced about a dozen fist-sized rocks and carefully placed them one at a time into the jar. When the jar was filled to the top and no more rocks would fit inside, he says, the jar full. Everyone in the class said yes. Then he said, really? He reached under the table and pulled out a bucket of gravel. Then he dumped some gravel in and shook the jar, causing pieces of gravel to work themselves down into the spaces between the big rocks. Then he smiled and asked the group, is the jar full? By, the, by this time, the class was on to him. Probably not, one of them answered. Good, he replied, and he reached under the table and brought out a bucket of sand. He started dumping the sand in, and it went into all the spaces left between the rocks and the gravel. Once more, he asked the question, is the jar full? No, the class shouted. Once again, he said, good. Then he grabbed a pitcher of water and it began to pour it into the jar until it was filled to the brim. Then he looked up at the class and asked, what's the point? One eager beaver raised his hand and said, the point is this. No matter how full your schedule is, if you really try hard, you can always fit more things in. <laughs> no, the speaker replied, that's not the point. The truth this illustration teaches is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in. If you don't put them in, you'll never get them in. If we want the if, if the gospel is a big rock, it's got to go in first. It can't be the frosting. It can't be, oh, and if I have time. If you believe the gospel is a big rock, and I think it's the biggest rock, it's got to go in first. You have to think about what your topic is on a daily basis and figure out, is there a way that I can integrate a gospel principle into this topic we're going to discuss today? And you may say, no. Okay, fine, you tried. But as you mature in your teaching career, continue to ask that question. You'll be a different person the next semester. You may see different things next semester. 
But I promise you, if you ask, how can I integrate the gospel into my class, you will get an answer. It may not come this semester. It may come next semester or the subsequent semester. If you don't ask, you won't find out. But if you ask, you'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at the connections you will see if you try. Or you can just wish you could play the violin and see how that goes. You've got to ask. So put the big rocks in first or you'll never get them in at all. Oh, but I'm scared. What about my content? Your content will be fine. Your content will be fine. Put the big rocks in first. Now, figure out your way to show that you care. The most interesting research I've ever done was asking this question. What makes effective teachers effective teachers? So we surveyed a lot of people on that. We looked at a lot of things on that, a colleague of mine and I, and to find out, you know, how, how do professors show how they care? And here is a, just a short list of potentials. This, is not, this may not be your way. You've got to find your way. But one is learn their names, or at least try to learn their names. I just got through the semester teaching 200 students. Impossible. I couldn't do it. Now, my hard drive's full. And I need to get it upgraded, but that's the resurrection. Uh, had one student with 88, had one section with 88 students in it. So I just walked around with my seating chart. And they knew I was trying. And they so appreciated that I was trying. I couldn't get 88, but I could try to get 88. And by the end of the class, and by the way, I, I mixed them up uh, two times during the semester. So as soon as I got them, I put them in different groups. Oh, that's all. Then as soon as I got that, I put them in different groups again because I wanted them to get to know different people. But I would walk around with this. Somebody would ask a question, and they just got in the habit of this. Cody, yes. I would just, they would wait until I found them. They so appreciated that, that I would try, because they were thinking, ain't no way. This guy's going to be able to do it, but man, he's crazy. He tries. They appreciate the effort. I had one section with 32 students. I was able to do that one. But I use a seating chart. And I don't apologize. Oh, I want them to think I know them. No, I don't know them. But I try. And they appreciate that. They love being called by their name. They just love that. So that's one thing. Be available and encourage them to come and see you. I did that all the time, and they never would come. But they knew if they did, I was there. I would tell them all the time, I'm like the main tag repairman. I just sit up there with nothing to do. And on occasion, they would drift by, and the first thing they'd say is, I know you're busy. No, I'm not busy. You are my job. I'm not too busy for you. They appreciated it. They didn't come all the time, but they knew when they did, I was waiting for them. Smile. That's a, I, that's, that's a big deal. I don't do that. I, my students, until they get to know me, they say, he's a stern. He's stern. My, my, my mouth naturally frowns. I naturally have a furrowed brow. My wife, the most common thing she says to me, the most common thing she says to me, smile. That's about the tone. Because people think you're angry. I'm not angry. Well, they, my people think you are. And once people get to know them, they say, oh, he's a, nice, he's a nice person. But it sure is scary to start with. And I don't mean to be that way. Exactly. I don't mean to be that way. That's just my face. Uh, students have to get used. So I try, that. I try to work on that. But I have varying degrees of success. It's not natural. Some people, they're born with a bursting face. You're so lucky. I am not that person. My students, I'm, I'm a, I scare my students to start with. They think, man, what's this guy? But over time, they realize, oh, I see. I see. Uh, but if you can do that, that's awesome. Another is be respectful of their time. Start class on time. End class on time. 
That's a big deal to students. It irritates them. When they get up and they're there on time and you roll in late. Or they've got a class clear across campus and you keep going. It's simple things. Simple things we can do that make a big difference. Be respectful of their time. Uh, so there's a bunch of others. You've got to find your way to show that you care about them. Yo, know, I care, I care. Yeah, but they need to feel that somehow. Uh, if, they know, if they know you care, they will learn anything you care to teach if they know you care. That's just the way it is. Even accounting. They will learn accounting once they realize, wow, this guy cares about me. Not just about accounting, but he cares about me. I have this drawing, and you can't see it, but this is a treasure to me. My daughter, who is 27 now, when she was six years old, I took her up to work with me. It was a Saturday morning, and I was working away, and she was off in the corner doing what six-year-olds do off in the corner. She was writing on every piece of paper she could get her hands on. And at the end of it, she handed me this. It says, you have to touch the heart to reach the mind. And she drew a little heart here, and then she has a little arrow from the word mind down to this brain, because she wasn't sure I'd be able to figure it out. <laughs> I'm sure Kara didn't invent that saying, but I don't know where the six-year-old got it. But that has significantly impacted me. You have to touch their heart to reach their mind. You just do. Oh, I'm here to be academic. Yeah, but you're at BYU. And at BYU, we're bigger than the brain. We're about their spirit. We're about their soul. We've got to get into their heart. Again, if they know you care, they will learn anything you care to teach. That's just the way it is. You have to figure out how are you going to uh, show them you care. And it's going to be different for you than it is for me. Again, your job is not to be me, and my job is not to be you. Figure out how you're going to show them that you care. Now, look for gospel connections. I love this. Because uh, here's, a, here's an important point that not many people realize. Turns out the spirit attends the accounting classes. Does the spirit attend yours? The spirit is in every classroom. Waiting for the moment where, boom, it can show forth. We have to invite it. And we have to be ready. What I have found is spiritual insights will pop into my head. They just will. And when that happens, what's the typical reaction? Woo, gotta keep going. Don't know what that was, gotta keep going. What I found is you gotta say it. You have to say it. Uh, Somebody out there needs to hear it. And so you have to say it. It's not, it's not popping into your head because of you. The Spirit is in your class. And if the Spirit gives you something, boom, take it and run with it. I have found, I used to be chicken to do that. You know, I don't, what? Someone popping my, what, what? And over time, I just said, well, I'm going with this. I'm just going to go with this. And it's amazing what can happen. If you see a connection, the Spirit will help you connect the dots. The Spirit will help. It is in your classroom, or particularly at BYU. The Spirit is here in every class, even accounting. It will help you as you try. But if you don't try, if you just wish, it's not going to happen. But if you try, the Spirit will stand there to help you. And by the way, students do love this. That's what they came here for. They hope that they will get this. But you know, they've dreamed about it since they were old enough to put on their first BYU sweatshirt. Someday I'm going to BYU. It's not for the football team. They think it's something bigger. I'm going to BYU and some magic will happen there. 
and it will if we'll try if we'll take advantage of it uh, what do we have to do to practice it's not going to go well I've gone home with bruises on my forehead, crooked nose from falling flat on my face, trying stuff. But you know what? I recover. It goes fine. It doesn't always work, but the more you practice, the better you get at it. Uh, it's to the point now where whatever comes into my head, I will say. And nine times out of ten, it's awesome. You have to have the courage to say it. You just have to have the courage. Uh, I remember once, I, my students will all tell you this. Brother Stice loves the Book of Mormon. I talk to him about it all the time. I challenge them to read the Book of Mormon all the time. I remind them on a regular basis, if you're not reading your scriptures, that cracking sound is the spiritual thin ice you're standing on. I tell them all the time. And one day I walked into class and I said, you'll never believe what happened. Jesus came to town. I got their attention. I said, yeah, I was in 35 chapter 11 and Jesus came. They thought, well, that's the coolest thing ever. Uh, last Friday I got this email from a student of mine. Thank you for a wonderful semester. The, the title of the email is, uh, Jesus came today. He said, I was, I was waiting to write you until I got to 35 chapter 11 so that I could use this title. I haven't missed a day of reading since I made the commitment after the first exam. Thank you for your reading invitation. Uh, it was a big deal to him because on May 1st, Jesus came. That's pretty awesome. What does that have to do with accounting? absolutely nothing but if he didn't learn anything it was worth it for that one thing that he's committed to read the scriptures every day forever that's awesome that was worth everything my wife and I went to St. George last weekend and I got back on Monday morning and I had a note taped to my or pen to my door. Hey, Dr. Stice, I thought I'd drop by and see my all-time favorite professor. That's nice. I just want to remind you how awesome you are and the positive impact you've had on my life. You used accounting as a tool to change hearts and touch lives. Thank you for your lifelong dedication and service to young students like me, parentheses, although I'm 51 now. This guy was a student of mine, graduated in 1991. God bless you. I don't know what accounting Dave learned, but I hope I made a difference to his testimony. We've got to uh, take the chance. Remember, if you create geniuses and don't affect testimonies, just want you to know you're doing it wrong. This is BYU got to take that leap of faith and integrate the sacred and the secular. Is it easy? It's like playing the violin. Did he make that look easy? That was phenomenal. But the price he paid to get to that point was significant. For me now, integrating the sacred and the secular, I don't, I don't, I don't do that anymore. They are, the, they are one because I've been practicing for so long. I don't have to think as much about integrating the sacred and the secular. They are just one thing to me. And they can become one thing to you if you start practicing, if you get at it. Let me end with this. Your class should be different here because you're here. The tithe pairs are paying for more than anthropology or history, or knowledge of the scriptures, or whatever, insert your discipline here. The tithe payers are hoping we help them be safe, help 
them have fun help them find friends help them learn something but strengthen their testimonies we can do it all and we don't have to give up anything we don't have to give up anything because you are here at b y u you have an advantage you can do things here you can't do anywhere else but because you can do things here that you can't do anywhere else you have to do those things i heard this saying once about a bishop a bishop could say things that nobody else can say so the bishop better say it well you can teach things because you are here that you can't teach other places and because you are here you better teach those things it's easy folks if we practice and if we take that leap of faith i promise and the more you do it the easier you get it gets and before you know it you'll wonder how you did it any other way i testify this is a very special place those young people in your classes are the future of the church and you are blessed to have the opportunity to influence them not everybody gets to do that but for some reason heaven has placed you here please take advantage of this unique and life changing opportunity please and i say that in the name of jesus christ amen, amen.